So do we wait for the other board members or do we know if everyone is going to come? Um, we, we, we don't know yet. Uh, uh, Ted said that he would join us from a baseball game, but we'll, we'll just have to see. Um, so I've started the recording. Uh, welcome everybody to the first Inkscape on Online Hackfest for 2020. Um, it's a bit experimental, but ho hopefully we'll have a good time. Uh, the day is divided into two parts. There's the more ca casual chatting and activities section, and then there is a meeting, which is in one hour's time. Today's me meeting is going to be with, with the Inkscape board, um, where if you are unsure, the board will introduce themselves and they will uh, be able to answer your questions. Um, we don't believe that there are any existing agenda items that have been raised uh, for the board meeting itself. So ho hopefully it will be open to uh, more quick questions and more interesting things. Um, the rest of the day is going to be um, basically two activities. One, if, if you're new to Inkscape, uh, new to being a contributor, uh, we'd like you to go to the Inkscape website, um, log in or register, and then add yourself to a particular team. Um, this is mostly just so that you can say that you're a part of a team and that we can track how many in individuals and if we needed to con contact the team to say, hey, there's something going on, uh, we know like who is interested in being involved. Um, the second is that we have a, basically it's a, it's a type of poll uh, in, in the shared notes. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have a brainstorm about what different teams in the project should be responsible for, what we think they should be responsible for, and then we're going to um, essentially vote by just adding a little, um, by the way, that, that in, the, in the slide is a plus, uh, but Inkscape has a bug where you, um, ironically, if you change the formatting of a, of a piece of text, it turns black. Um, so, oops. Um, so yeah, just add a plus sign to if you think that responsibility is something that, that team, you think that team should do, and then add your own if you think that there are things that, that are missing. Um, there are definitely missing teams. I didn't add, add them all to the shared notes. I just kind of st started stuff off. Um, so welcome everybody. Oh, I should note, um, I, I, by default I've muted everybody, um, but if you want to talk, just let me know. Uh, you can either raise your hand and I'll shut up for a while or um, enable your audio. Uh, you have to enable your microphone and um, we can have a pleasant chat about uh, um, teams or leadership or just Inkscape in, gen in general. And uh, thank you everybody for coming to this first, first event. That's it, I think I'm gonna add myself to the, to the board team. So in, in, in the website, I added this idea of a, of a um, principal team, sort of like the first thing that you do in the, in the, in the pro project or the thing that you think of yourself as. Um, so say if you're a developer, you write yourself as an Inkscape de developer. If you just consider yourself a user, just add yourself as an Inkscape user. Um, and then I'm trying to attract some people to uh, do some little graphics. Right now it'll show a little um, piece of text on your website pro, pro profile, but it's open to having a little image there too. Um, and that, hopefully that'll make people like have a pro profile where they're like, I'm an Inkscape user or I'm an Inkscape developer. Um, if you do join the Inkscape developers team, uh, the team is uh, cl closed for automatic join jo joining. So we need to uh, approve I believe anybody should be able to approve that. Um, Martin, you can share your screen if you want to show stuff on the website. Good idea. I'm always scared about sharing my screen because with J Jitsi, sometimes when I share the screen, um, my desktop crashes and I have to restart the, the entire of Xorg. Oh, you're on Wayland? No, it works. 
Um, so, for instance, this is the Inkscape developer team. If I go to my my settings, I can I can change the, the principal team, and you'll see some of the teams say request membership. Uh, the developer team will say that too, um, and as soon as you do do that, it will um, tell me on the right hand side here. So I'll see join join requests. And where I see, see them, if I if I know that you're definitely a developer, I recognize you, then I can I can uh, accept the request and you'll join. For for other teams, um, they're they're all open and you can just join them. You join join team. Um, so e each of the teams that we have on the website has a um, a set of communications channels. So for instance, the users team has the IOC, has the Rocket Chat, has the the, the forum. Um, and, so, and so does the developer team. Um, they have the Rocket Chat and the IOC chat room. Um, these are just convenience links so that if you ever need to find out, like, who, how do I contact the developers, um, this is probably the best way to do it, especially if you, you want to talk to a different team and you want to say, hey, you know, how, how do I talk to the board or how do I talk to um, translations, et cetera. Um, we're, still, we're still expanding the links. Um, to make sure that you know, maybe we want to have the mailing lists there. Um, this is all very much uh, available for anybody to com 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 comment on. Uh, I should also point out that if you are a developer, um, you should definitely be on GitLab as well. Um, the web the Inkset website is not a um, platform for, de for development. It's just a place for uh, more casual and social interactions and just to organize things. Uh, but GitLab itself is where we do a lot of the contributions. So um, if you are un unaware of how to do that, let us know and we can uh, point you in the right, the right direction. Looks like we, we have quite quite a few individuals. By the way, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to uh, post them in the chat and we will try to answer them. Absolutely. I'm going to have myself a cup of tea now. <laughs> um. If they're while we're waiting for questions um, or other topics, I can give a rundown of what the board is and the history. So uh, when Inkscape started, we were just a regular open source project. Um, and uh, but early on, people would ask how they can contribute to Inkscape, and so we'd say, "Well, send us patches, ideas, um, so forth," and. Uh, uh, we didn't really have a board back then. Um, there's a few of us that founded the project, but we were essentially kind of just a group of equals working on the project. Um, and uh, so we'd encourage people to, instead of, you know, sending money, send code. Uh, but there were people that didn't want to send patches. They, or they couldn't send patches, and so they wanted a way to contribute money. So uh, I set up a PayPal account for people to put their donations to, and a lot of people would donate to it. So it got to be to where the uh, the income tax on this was significant. Um, I went ahead and paid it, but it felt it felt like this wasn't the right way to do things. And I looked around at what other projects did. 
uh, there were some that had their own uh, nonprofit foundation. Um, but around this time is also when the Software Freedom Conservancy started. Um, and so we kind of talked about, does that make sense for Inkscape? And uh, we thought it did, because not only would they cover, not only would they let us be a nonprofit um, or let us join them as the nonprofit, and then we'd be a, like a, a, a part of their organization. They also handle legal matters, trademarks, um, and other organizational things that sounded like useful things to for the project. So we, um, I don't even remember what year it was, but we joined uh, SFC. One of the things they required was that we have um, a, a membership agreement, a charter, basically. And as part of that, to also have a committee of, of leaders uh, they didn't care how we formed it, or but they wanted it to be defined in some sort of legal document. So that was the origin of the board. Uh, we came up with the the rules and guidelines ourselves, and uh, held our own elections, decided what the election rules would be, uh, and um, put the board together. And sh and then we shifted the money from my PayPal account into the official Inkscape account uh, over a couple of years. Um, we also got the Inkscape trademark registered. Uh, Ted was really uh, instrumental in that and in, in making sure we got all the, the right things registered and the right rules around them. Because we didn't want to really register it to restrict people from being able to use the, the logo in interesting ways. But we wanted to give guidance for people that wanted to use it for maybe commercial purposes or for marketing purposes um, to give them some good solid guidelines what they could and couldn't do with it. So I think those are pretty well um, well written now uh, if anybody did want to use it. We're, I think we're a little bit more permissive than people expect for that. But at the same time, we do protect it. And over the years with the SFC, we've actually gone after a few people that have been trying to sell Inkscape um, as their own thing and they've rebranded it or they've used our logo for uh, unrelated products or things. Um, so that's been really helpful for us to have them be registered through them. Um, after a while, we were we continue to accumulate income from generous people donating to the project. And uh, so the question became, like, how are we going to put this money to use? So one of the first ideas that we uh, pursued was organizing Hackfest because this would be a way for us to get together in person uh, and cover travel costs of whoever wants to to attend those. So a lot of what the board does is organizing those Hackfests, uh, covering costs of people that are traveling to them, and all the paperwork associated with that. Uh, and so I think this is the first year since we started that we have not gotten together in person, but this, this Hackfest uh, will hopefully make up for that. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do more. Uh, the income kept coming in uh, to where we, uh, I think a couple times had two hack fests in a year. We've also covered uh, expenses for um, attendees of other conferences that are giving presentations or accepting awards on behalf of Inkscape. We've done um, a book, a developer book project where we gave out, um, I think it was books of your choice from a list of technical topics to uh, the top developers. Um, and we've done, done other things like that. We've also been very active with uh, printing stickers and other uh, handouts for people um, at events or just through the mail. Uh, and we're always looking for new ideas of things that we could uh, put the money to good use for the project. Um, we've also talked about how we could work on the revenue source as well of donations. And so we've uh, we set up the Spreadshirt site um, to sell merchandise, uh, and we've looked at other things uh, like that. Along with that, we've also had a number of sponsors that have uh, chipped in large amounts of money. We have a, uh, a program set up of different levels that sponsors can donate to support Inkscape, and these go directly into the funds um, towards Hackfest and, and the rest of it. Uh, and that kind of brings us to where we are today. With all that, we started having, when, when the board first started, we didn't organize any meetings and we didn't really vote on very much. Uh, but over time, the board became more and more active as the needs ramped up. Um, and to 
uh, to now, uh, we do monthly meetings um, where we get together and go through the agenda just like a regular uh, committee would and uh, decide, you know, decisions for the projects. We do not do technical decisions, though. Um, that's one of the things that this board is not, is, is deliberately not involved with. That said, at the meeting, since we, many of us are developers or involved in development in some fashion, um, we do talk about uh, technical topics here and there. So that's it right, for the so history. Yeah. I have, a, I have a quick question about uh, the board's role when it comes to leading Inkscape. Um, a sample question has come up in the, um, the there's, a, there's a website next project, which is in its early phases that is deciding on how to redesign the Inkscape website. And part of the issue that they're currently struggling with is the um, what authority do they have to make decisions about which Inkscape users they should focus the website towards? And how do they go about being granted the right authority or the right permissions um, to feel like they are uh, contributing with the best interests of the pro pro project and with the general consensus? Um, so is this a question of how the board would be involved in that decision? Yeah, I mean, so so uh, often uh, the board is looked on uh, to have to host a more leadership role, even though right. it's, it's it's more concrete uh, roles are, are well defined and, and actually quite small. Um, but in this particular instance, for example, um, the the team behind the website next project may want to come to the board and ask us directly to give them permission for something. How, how should the Inkscape project as a whole uh, deal with giving permissions? Uh, so we've, we have been involved in um, things like uh, the discussions around organizing the forum and uh, when we transition to GitLab. Uh, and in, in all that, it has involved uh, some granting of permissions and, and setting up um, uh, leadership groups for, for teams, uh, establishing the vectors as well. Um, I think the board's role should be uh, as much to enable that to happen and then get out of the involvement. So whatever permission needs to be given, you know, we discuss it, we decide we give it, and then we don't run the project, we just enable them to start. Does that make sense? So our preference, so for, for a website, if, if they're going to be involved with um, permitting members to do things, we would want to review how that is chartered uh, and make sure it's fair and appropriate for the project uh, and make sure that the, the, uh, the guidelines are well written and then turn it over to them and be involved with the day-to-day -day decision making of, of that. Would, would we de designate particular in individuals um, for specific kinds of permissions, let's say a person X is involved in this project and wants to be sort of like the responsible individual, would we designate and say this person can make decisions on this particular project? Yeah, I mean, that's something we could certainly do if, if that would be the, if that would be what they would desire uh, for it to work. I don't think there's any, like, we don't require the project to work in any particular way, right? We're here for the benefit of the project. So if they need some leadership to make decisions about things, we can do that. But we, uh, I don't think we want to be controlling the project. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So we want to listen to what, we want to listen to how they want things to be done, and then we give them the permission to do them the way they want. And then maybe make some suggestions if, if there's anything. The only uh, situations where we really have to be careful is if there's trademark issues financial issues, either accepting money or spending money. Um, if there's any um, issues with like harassment or interpersonal problems that we need to be careful of. Um, and then uh, also um, ownership of resources. So like the ownership of uh, DNS records or um, uh, like with a Spreadshirt site, we had to have SFC be the owner of that site rather than one of us. Same sort of thing with um, any app stores or anything like that, where there might be some sort of legal agreement to make. 
those are the things that we have to be more careful of and make sure that the permissions are, um, you know, by the book. But things for like the day-to-day -day operation of the project, you know, we're just here to enable everybody else to do what they need to do. So, so a good example is that recently I was asked um, about a fundraising site, and I'm trying to pull up the link, but I honestly I can't remember which ch channel it was in. Um, where we are apparently getting some money for Libre pay. Libre pay. pay. Yeah. yeah. So in that particular instance, what what's the process if a person discovers that there is some resources or there's a site or there's a framework that Inkscape could join, what is the, the, the process by which that becomes an official part of the sort of money paid or legal system? So the first thing is to, for something like that, and that's an exact, exactly a good example of, of a financial related decision. So that, that should go through the board, um, contact myself or one of the other board members and get it on the agenda or just put it on the agenda yourself, um, then the board will discuss it. For something like that, we will need to go through the SFC. And so there's a process for getting a ticket established. Um, we as a project or as, as the board would also need to do a vote on if this is something we, we want to do. Uh, you know, I'm sure that we would, but uh, legally we need to actually vote on it. So the votes are conducted um, not on chat, but through email, so we have a uh, established record, and so that's consistent with our past uh, decisions. And then we forward that, I forward that to SFC, and then that starts the process on their end. For something like this, there may be some additional um, uh, work to do with the SFC uh, if if they haven't uh, set up Libre Pay before. They may have, I don't know, but they may have some additional requirements that we need to uh, go through to get that established. Um, so yeah, so that would be a good topic. Excellent. So you'd want to, you want items to be brought to the board's meeting and then the board can make a general decision about um, whether the, this is something that the project wants to engage in as a, as a financial option. Right. And then that's brought to the SFC. Right. Now, it's, for this particular issue, I can give a little bit more context, I guess, in that over the years, we've had a number of different um, pay systems come to us uh, uh, and say, hey, you know, Inkscape could get income through our system or through this system or whatever. And I've brought them to the to FSF, FSF, SFC. And sometimes they push back and said that, you know, we really need, we can't enable every single payment provider. Uh, we kind of tend to focus on the the more popular ones like PayPal and and so forth. Um, so unless it's something we really have a strong intention to do a lot of uh, get a lot of income through, then we may see them say, "Eh, we'll skip this one." I don't know what the situation with Libre Pay. It sounds like a more a bigger one, so it might be worth talking to them about. But uh, just as historical context, I have gotten some pushback on some of the smaller ones where like somebody may have, have given us a donation through that, but it's kind of like a, a loss leader kind of thing where they're trying to get us to sign up for their platform so that gives a little a little cash on the side, but the amount that we would get is not worth SFC's time of, of setting up all the, the legal and financial arrangements for it. Right, so I, so I take it that the SFC has, has employees on, on like Inkscape itself. Um, yes. How, how do they cover their, their, their costs for legal and financial advice that they, they give to us? Um, they get a lot through direct donations to them. Um, I, I'm not really involved in their finances, so I don't know the full scope of, of where they get funding. I know it's through sources other than um, projects for the most part. We do contribute 10% um, of all income from to Inkscape uh, to them. And I think all the other projects do as well. Uh, so they do get some income through that. But uh, the amount of work they do from us kind of exceeds the amount that we're paying them, if that makes sense. Like um, they, they're constantly looking into legal uh, issues or setting things up or doing accounting. And um, it's such trouble make, make, makers for the legal department. Yeah, yeah, we are. And we should. We need to keep that in mind, like as we run into things that are like, that doesn't seem right, but if it's a small thing, like, do we really want to waste their time 
chasing down some random issue. So, you know, I, I always try to balance that whenever things come up. Like, do I really want to get them spun up on something that isn't going to make a big difference to us? Can you speak to um, some of the, the projects that we've been involved in with them in terms of legal or I, I, I see I think we've covered the financial side of things, but when it yeah. comes to legal disputes, for instance, with trade trademark or, or copyright. They did a huge amount with us to get the logo trademarked and um, to get our name trademarked or registered. Um, and that's an ongoing uh, expense to every, I don't know how many years we have to renew. Um, and that's expensive and it, it, uh, uh, it takes work to enforce that as well. We can't just register it and then ignore it. Um, as there are people that infringe on our trademark, we have to um, defend it or we lose it. So fortunately, there haven't been very many cases we've had to go after. Um, there was a case recent, uh, a couple of years ago with Wacom where they put out a, pro a product of their own called Ink Space, uh, which we felt uh, infringed our trademark. And so we went after them and got legal, um, a legal decision against them to, um, to change their name. And that has been, it didn't turn out exactly as we had kind of hoped, but at least it defended our mark. And I don't know if they still put that product out, but they're not supposed to. So at least not in the US. Um, other things, we get a lot of cases where like uh, someone putting on a presentation or a, a, a conference or uh, publishing a book or other material want to include Inkscape's logo or um, the Inkscape software itself. And we're very permissive. In the, I mean, we like those. That's kind of the, the usage that we'd like to see. We get a lot of those questions and they're you know easy. Yeah, of course you can. Um, there's manufacturers that make uh, like uh, scrapbooking cutters or other printers and they want to ship Inkscape on, their, on the CD that comes with the product. That's cool. Um, so we get a lot of questions like that. They're easy. And then there's some where like uh, uh, people are taking Inkscape software, renaming it, uh, changing the logo, and then selling it. And those are not OK. And um, a lot of those are kind of fly by night uh, things that are more, it's more of, uh, it's more victimizing the people that are using that product than victimizing us ourselves because since we don't sell Inkscape, it doesn't like affect our revenue, but we still uh, try to work through the legal system to get them to adhere to the GPL at least. Because um, it's not it's not illegal to take Inkscape and rebrand it, right? Like people do that with Firefox or other open source projects. But there is a fine line if you don't provide the source code, um, then and you don't give away for users to access the source code, then you're infringing on the license, and that's something that, that can be gone after. Um, there's also, the, there's also the, the issue of the trademark actually being in, in the source code itself as well. So right, if yeah, if you go that route, right. you, you have to be thorough. Yeah, you have yeah. to scrub. And we also would expect that you, know, you can't pass your trouble tickets on to us. We've seen that a few times where bug reports have shown up of like, it's like, no. And then in fact, this is what happened with Wacom, right? So like the reason why we yeah. learned about their, their product is because um, their their customers started contacting our website for, for yeah, yeah. people. For supporting were, something we didn't even make. <laughs> for something we didn't make because they were confused about the mark. And that's a clear indication that there was a problem. Um, because I don't think we would have gone after Wacom if we hadn't had a like a concrete case that there was people out there who were confused between whether Inkscape was a Wacom pro project, whether Inkspace was a was an Inkscape project, um, and so like making sure that that's clear and that they make it they, they they treat their customers well and they treat our project with respect. I think that that, that was important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so what are one, oh, go on, go on, go on, Bryce. No, I was just going to say, are there any other things that you can think of that? Good projects we can tell them about. Uh, sorry, can you can you explain uh, what good projects were it? Uh, that we've done with S SFC. 
Oh, I see, yeah. Um, so there is, there is, I think, uh, some positive things that we've done with them in, in physical space, you know, where, where we've met up with them um, mm -hmm. and being able to go out to dinner or, been, or, or run a booth or, you know. Um, so it's been nice to have people who um, are professional and they, they, they host events and you can actually go see them and talk to them. Um, I don't know what your experience has been like, but say, for instance, their scale. Um, but here, here on in, in in Boston, when we host the um, uh, f f um, Soccer Freedom Day, uh, by the the FSF hosts, we often get the the the, the conservancy and Brad Bradley is is in attendance, and it's nice to be able to talk to him in person. Yep, I had a long talk with him at the last, or not the last uh, scale, but the one last year. So one, one question I did want to bring bring up, which is the um, the idea of um, the transparency of communications. So the board and all of the commun communication that goes on within Inkscape is all uh, very, very tran transparent. We try very, very hard to make sure that nothing is happening in private channels. When it comes to the SFC, on the other hand, uh, almost everything that we talk to them about is pri private. And in fact, some of the, some of the things that are happening uh, we are precluded from even sh sharing that we are making discussions about those things so how, how do we how do we um, make sure that the the people who are not on the board who are not privy to those discussions are um, kept in the loop sort of, yeah can, can, can yeah. trust the transparency and how, how do we how do we move com com conversations from the FFC private block into the public yeah well, this is one of the reasons that um, I've always tried to make sure that we get the logs of the meetings, the board meetings, posted online publicly so that everybody can, you know, go through and see the exact discussion that we have. Um, I've always kind of been torn between whether the board mailing list should be public or private. Um, I believe they're public uh, with the last mailing list transition. I believe the archives are all public. But yeah, we have to be careful because we do have discussions that um, involve legal matters or individuals' financial um, transactions, you know, for their reimbursements or whatever, uh, and personal information. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that just should not be public. So we, you know, we don't really, we have a structured channel for the public consumption of our board information. The private stuff is a lot more ad hoc. Sometimes we, do GPG encrypted emails. Sometimes it's just regular emails, uh, and sometimes it's in-person uh, talks or phone calls um, that we've done. So I always think about that, like you know, what, where do we draw the line between what we can publicize, and what we can? I, I hope that we give an adequate visibility into things, um, but it's something we always have to think about and work on. One of the ideas was that um, while the board, say mailing list and other channels are, are more private, um, is it worth introducing or having a sort of board plus or like a leadership channel, which is either a mailing list or a rocket chat or an ISC channel, where the whole idea of it is just yeah. to discuss things publicly rather than... Yeah, and this, this, actually, this actually came up with infrastructure stuff uh, in that... Um, we wanted to, we thought about having a private discussion place for infrastructure things like mailing lists and websites where we might need to talk about um, network configurations and structures that we don't really want to publicize just for security reasons. So it occurred to me that maybe, yeah, we need to have like a, a each, each group, each team needs to have both a public and private list. I haven't really pursued that because it just, it just, I don't know. We probably do need to do that, but it seems like kind of a slippery slope. I know in my job uh, at Canonical that um, we have public and prior, semi-public and private lists, uh, and then this discussion tends to always just gravitate towards the private. And so, you know, you lose transparency by doing that. So I've, I don't know, I need more, uh, more ideas and opinions on what we should do there. Yeah, I mean, my, my personal opinion is that I think we, we currently strike a good balance uh, because the, the 
places where it's the easiest to contribute and the easiest to discussion are all public, public which means that the, the vast majority of discussions about everything happens um, in places that are logged, places that are accessible. Um, and yeah, and a, lot really... of these, a lot of these private things are kind of case by case things anyway, you know, like a dispute yeah. or a, you know, whatever. And so handling those in kind of an ad hoc way. So I, I can actually talk to, okay. to, for instance, how we uh, have handled some private uh, issues. Um, we had an issue uh, with the um, uh, the about screen con con contest for one point one, 1 zero, right? So that this is a website issue primarily. The website looked very much like it had been hacked, such that one particular um, entry had a pile of votes that just like cascaded in around the same time, and. Uh, we set up a private rocket chat in order to get, you know, different voices and different brains into the same room, so we could have a discussion about this vote that was still live, right? People could still vote for, for things, but we needed to have a think about what our response should be, right? And the responses ranged from do nothing to uh, do something, right? So like cancel votes or like think about this, and so part of that was like. What is the data collection that we should do, you know, and how should we make that that decision? Uh, eventually, the decision was to do nothing because we found that the votes, while they looked artificial, were natural enough not to cause too much of a concern. Um, but it was it was an unusual situation because it looked like the uh, person who had posted the artwork had basically asked all, all of their friends to vote, and their friends had voted very faithfully. Um, so we, we, we do have issues like that. Sometimes we have issues where um, a person has an interpersonal problem, and that as well we set up a private rocket chat. Is, is, is a private rocket chat channel a good enough place to be able to talk about some of these private issues? I think it is, and the reason I say that is because we run the rocket chat instance, and I think we're, one of the benefits of running our own software is that we know we have... Um, jurisdiction, I guess, over the whole uh, thing. So we know that the information is not going to get leaked out, or if it does, it's our fault. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the safest we can get. I can't imagine any, well, you know, with, with, with some things you need to go to uh, maybe more, you know, direct telephone calls or meet in person or something. But I think if, uh, if it's going to be online and it's on our own, um, hardware that's probably good enough. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, the the meeting behind behind the bike sheds and trench trench coats, passing seats and CDs between each other. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's been so far. We I think composed ourselves well um, in terms of um, understanding that the project is a public project primarily, and that sometimes we do have situations where we need to talk privately. I mean, a good example of this is the code of con conduct, right? Which sets out how uh, different yeah. individuals should interact when they have issues with each other. And part of that is is communicating to other individuals privately in order to be able to talk about, you know, sometimes heated problems, interpersonal issues that really don't need to be heard out. Yeah. Uh, you don't need third part parties coming in, making com com comments and opinions about things. Um, and so like those particular kinds of private discussions have been, um, valuable to promote right because that because we actually do guide users towards using private channels for that re reason um, alternatively I've had situations where people have come up contacted me on rocket chat uh, privately in order to talk about things like extensions right so like hey how do I do this in extensions and to me that's that's an inappropriate use of a private channel because there's nothing about that discussion that couldn't help somebody else who was reading it as well, right? So if somebody else wanted to chime in, plus I'm, I'm also not the be all and end all of extensions. Like just, just asking me is, is limiting your, um, you know, the number of people that you, that may be able to answer the question. Um, so it's, so it's a balancing act. Sometimes I do actually have to tell people to move this to a public channel, but it, it, it can be hard. No, you're exactly right. And that's exactly what you should do. And, as long as I can remember, that's always kind of been a pattern. I think it's for someone, especially someone that's not been involved with the project, it can be um, 
a little bit scary to speak up in a public place where you don't know who all is going to be responding to what you say and you don't know if you're going to say the right right thing or wrong thing and so if there's a particular person that you know and you feel comfortable with them or they seem to be more active then of course you're going to naturally want to just privately chat with them but then for that person to encourage them to get you know no 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 come on let's discuss this publicly that's the right thing to do and like i said as long as i've been involved in open source that's always been a thing with every project um, so it's just something that we as as active project members need to just always keep in mind and, and do as a regular thing. I mean, I think I think uh, in the open source world, it, it, we've always had the case where all of our uh, frameworks, all of our communications ch channels have been designed to be public first. Um, yeah. So it's, been, it's actually been hard technically to communicate privately, except for instance, of phoning somebody or meeting them in per person. Um, I'm thinking of things like mentors, right? So like when you want to talk to uh, a mentor or a mentor, that's a situation where a private chat channel can ease people in uh, to making them comfortable. Um, for example, just before they, they enter the public channels, if they have concerns and things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, as much as possible, do things public or, you know, we can always set up more public channels. There, um, uh, I learned a lesson very early on that you don't want to have too many discussion channels because you end up, if you start setting up uh, channels for every topic that you could possibly talk about, people just get confused and they just gravitate towards, you know, whatever channel everybody else is on. And so then everything just kind of devolves to that and it just becomes kind of chaos. So you want to constrain the number of channels that are there and only add them when you already have a discussion that has taken over the channel. So like the uh, the Mac port was a, a good example of where we established their own channel because we could see already that it was like this butted off group that was discussing things that needed their own space to do that. Um, so yeah, we had a similar situation with the, with, with the media team, which is probably maybe not a team that you're aware of, but it's just a collection of individuals who contribute to Inkscape via, yep. via creating artwork for the project, right? So they're not yeah. creating artwork for themselves in Inkscape. Yep. They're creating artwork maybe in Blender or some other thing for the project. Um, and we split them out because there was a lot of discussion going on in the Vectors team, and it was disrupting the, the Vectors team. Exactly, yeah. That's the organic way that it should happen, so that's good. Yeah, as, as things grow, um, we can so set up can, more, more teams. So a counterexample to that is how we organize the forums. So in the forums, um, and, I'll, and I'll just quickly share the uh, Firefox window. So the forums, uh, we actually had to set up uh, each of these channels by thinking about, first of all, what users might want to talk about uh, without really knowing where the, where the demand was. Um, you know, we, we figured there would be questions, and we figured there might be extensions. Um, but beyond the, beyond certain things, it's been difficult. Um, though, an example of where Bryce's um, uh, idea about making sure that the demand is is pushing the um, availability is the, is this in, in international German ch channel, which was created because of a demand for being able to post things in German and get answers in German. Um, but still, you can see that there are some channels which are which are much less frequented, and then there are others that are much more so. Like 1,600 messages is a, is a lot di different than 11. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so, it's, so it's an evolving situation where we have to make decisions about um, what users, or, or even contributors, right? Not just, not just users, um, where, where they need to be able to talk what kinds of subjects? Uh, because I feel like the the, the rails that we make, uh, the spaces that we create, uh, do actually end up sh shaping the kinds of discussions that happen. Um, partially, the lack of a leadership channel in terms of the Rocket Chat or IFC or ma mailing lists, I feel contributes to the the homelessness of some discussions. Right. So, like some some discussions that happened in the Vectors team about how things should be led. Uh, some discussions about money, uh, for, for example, where the, where the default is always to go, well, let's bring this up with the board. And the board meeting itself is, is a very short event. Um, 
doesn't have space to to really talk about these issues and so that's an example of where perhaps we want to think about um, creating a new space simply because we have a demand there for certain kinds of discussions that don't seem to be fitting right now yeah so a couple things um, one is that as individual teams feel that they need a more structured event like the board meeting to be able to come to resolution on topics, I would encourage them to kind of do something similar to the board, set up meetings um, to discuss things, you know, monthly or ad hoc or whatever makes sense and invite people, including board members, if you want, um, to help you drive those decisions. Um, sometimes just the structure of a meeting can be effective at, at kind of organizing thoughts and, and reaching decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing is that um, the, for the development team, uh, I know the ideas come up that they may need a more regular monthly meeting, um, either tacked onto the board meeting or associated with the board meeting or separate from the board meeting, uh, which is something I think we're going to talk about at this meeting. Um, so, I mean, that could make a lot of sense because I know there's a lot of, now that 1.0 is finished, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made about priorities and uh, development coordination and things like that. So having a space to discuss development specific things because like I said, the board was chartered not to do technical decisions for the project. But if we do need a, something to make technical decisions, you know, maybe we set something up. So that's a that's an interesting example. Um, the board has a has a cadence of a once per month meeting, which is which is integral to its char charter, in fact. And part of the success for the, the vectors team has been that they also have a monthly meeting, right. which they have right. been very good at, um, at uh, keeping going. Is, is, is a monthly cadence meeting something that we should encourage all teams that have a certain size um, or a certain importance in the project to to? No, I, I think it. Do? we treat it organically. We let them decide that, yes, we need to do it and we should do it. Because, I mean, honestly, it takes it's really hard to set up the monthly meetings. The Vectors team had a lot, you know, a number of meetings that were just didn't turn out successfully before they, you know, got their footing and got things under, underway. Um, organizationally and they knew what they were doing and how to do it and they had their agendas and, and so forth exactly the same with the board it was even worse uh, years went by where we had really really bad meetings um, before we finally kind of got our our pace to it and the same thing with any team I don't think we should push any team to go through that they have to want to do it and need to do it because it's hard and um, they need to be motivated to to make it work because otherwise it won't work so no, I don't think we should push it. We should encourage it, but not push it or require it. As a member of the dev team, I really, really think that we should do like weekly meetings with developer, active developers. Uh, yeah, that, that actually might be nice just to have a, a weekly catch up rather than a more official meeting. Mark, how long yeah, yeah. do you think we should, we should talk for uh, on a weekly basis? Uh, at most one hour, but uh, if it's half an hour, it's fine. It's just two. I, I think we need a meeting for ju even simple things like uh, what did you do? What where, where did you have problems? Uh, what did you notice as the regressions? And uh, what are the bugs that you think are most important to fix quickly? If we can talk about that every week, it would be like fantastic. One thing that I do at work, and I know a lot of people do, is we have daily stand-ups, um, which are like forced to be no longer than 15 minutes. So you really have to be concise in communicating what you're working on and what your your needs are. You might want to think about that from a weekly, you know, standpoint. Do like a, a weekly half-hour stand-up where you intentionally limit the amount of time that you have to discuss these things. So when people come, they know they're only signing up for half an hour that they have to be on time and they have to have their topics ready to discuss and then you get through them and then if you have follow-up discussion set up a separate chat or meeting to discuss those in more depth um, that could work really well i've seen that in a lot of other projects yeah there's, there's i mean there's a lot of uh, organic chat that happens um for for, de for developers but um we are i think but i think we'd all agree sort of discoordinated in terms of um, the, because because lots of developers are running at different speeds and they also have different priorities about what they're trying to do 
So um, I per personally, as a developer, would like to see more meetings. Um, thinking about non-core developer situations, like extensions, website code, other stuff. Um, honestly, I don't think those necessarily need to have uh, meetings because they're not at the scale. They don't have the number of people involved um, yet to, to, to basically have the, that kind of structure. And I don't think we should crowd out the, the C++ code base um, because I think that's something that needs a lot more um, leadership or, or just organization. Coordination. Co coordination. Yeah, coordination is actually the, be the better approach because uh, Inkscape is a very um, egalitarian and, and, and flat structure. So there's less leadership top down, more, way more uh, bottom up. Yeah. Um, so Mark, do you, do you want to start doing, try to start doing weekly meetings? Pick a time and... Yeah, yeah. We, we need to talk with everyone to find what time is best and if we should uh, rotate the time uh, in the day to fit several uh, time zones constraints. But yeah. We'll make that like, the, agenda, we, we, the first agenda item of your first meeting. Yeah. Finding the right, the right time to meet. Yeah, I I've, I've, I've found that there's really only one time a day that, that works for everybody. Well, if you don't have anybody in Australia or Asia, there's one time a day, which is kind of when the board meeting is, that tends to work for everybody. If you have Australians or you have Asians in the, the mix, then that we have changes in, things a bit. We have Indians in the Summer of Code. So we have two people in uh, like opposite of uh, California. So we did the Summer of Code meetings at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, California, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, India, which was not it, it was the best we could do but equally uh inconvenient for everybody yeah just make that the first uh first item of the agenda of the first meeting but, but <laughs> if we had people in china or in australia or new zealand then it would we we would need to rotate and not have everyone every time yeah in uh one project or one on the desktop team for canonical uh we had that situation and so they just ro rotated every release cycle they had it at a different time and then they just kept consistent at that time for that cycle. Um, but anyway, there's lots of lots of different approaches that people use, and you know, just talk it out and see what people prefer to do. And consistency is good. Yeah, you know, question. You... Almost everyone is in Europe, though. Yes. Um, so, so the veterans team has has a more. Um, uh, I don't say st st structured, but they but but they have a leader uh, who is responsible for organizing the meetings and for for trying to help with the organization. Is is the developer team something that could do with having, if not an official leader, where actual decisions are made, more of like a um, monarchy uh, uh, leadership, where you have uh, some somebody who can ho hold the position and just run meetings, for for example. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, run, running meetings is not that hard. You just need to look at the time and push questions when time comes. I mean, my, my, my particular thing is that I want to be able to put a sticker on some, some someone's face on the web website that says leader. I know, I know. But I, I, <laughs> I don't think that, in my experience, you can't just designate somebody to lead a project. You can't just like, you know, give that assignment and say, okay, you're in charge of making all the decisions. You know, it just never works. Um, the way that it works is that you, you get the team together, you let them churn a while, and a leader will emerge from the team, and the team will know it, and they'll recognize them, and that person will just start doing the work. And so then you say, okay, well, clearly you're the guy in charge of this team, you know, you lead it. Uh, that has been historically the way it's, it's worked in Inkscape. Um, all the, the projects and teams that we've done in the past have been an organic leader that comes up rather than somebody that is uh, assigned that. Um, so so one, one of the things that we've struggled with in the developers team is, is precisely that problem is that there hasn't, I don't think, been an organic leader that has emerged. Um, well, there's been we several. Release. No, oh, I mean, no. I mean, I... Historical, yes, but. Right now, I would right now. think Mark is kind of the lead developer. I mean, he was the release coordinator for 1.0. Um, he seems to be the 
active person leading things right now. I assume that he is. If if Mark doesn't think he is, then he can. That is also the, the tricky part. So, sort of. <laughs> And it, yeah. it isn't something that needs to be one person permanently. Um, you know, any leadership position is going to get, it's time consuming and it, it wears you out after a while. And development especially can be, I mean, in this project, since development is why we're all here, um, that can be really intense. And so the chances of burnout is, is really high. So I don't think we should, I, I wouldn't say a monarchy is the right thing. Because um, nobody's going to be able to do it forever. I'm going to uh, take a five minute break uh, and I'll be right back for the board meeting. Um, thank you, Bryce, for basically sure. talk, talking and filling in a lot of the information. Yeah, um, let's see. Are there any questions while Martin's gone? We have Chris arriving. Hi, Chris. Hello. Sorry, had webcam problems. Oh, it was not a problem. Web webcam webcams are locked for everyone except until I unlocked manually the person. Ah, that works. I'll stop uh, refreshing my browser then. On the topic of teams, one thing that um, when we moved to GitLab, uh, I really wanted to try to get a little bit more structure and consistency in how teams are organized. So there's a, a better mapping between a team and its chat channel and the mailing list that that they're on and other resources and things to have kind of a more of a cohesive set of services for a team. So that if we do start a new team, then we have kind of like a pattern to follow of like, okay, well, you get a mailing list, you get a chat channel, you get blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think we're to that level of organization as a project, but, um, and I don't even know if that's really appropriate all the time. Like one thing I learned with the vectors is that IRC channel, you know, just assigning an IRC channel for the vectors team is not, not suitable to what they need. They needed something uh, different, which ended up leading us all to the chat uh, system. Um, so having like a can approach may not be the best way, but um, I do like the idea of, of having well-defined teams uh, and making sure they have all the resources that they need and having some consistency. So if you participate in one team and you go to another team, it's not like a completely foreign land. It's like a lot of the tools and processes have some consistency. Yeah, we have bridges yeah. between teams. Yeah, one of the advantages of using the chat is that it's, it's persistent. So if you miss something and you can come back later and you don't have to set up like a server to <laughs> keep track of it. Um, so it's much more accessible to uh, say non-geek um, non or <laughs> maybe- Non-developers. Non <laughs> yeah, like myself. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And um, that's one thing that I've, I've found that collecting and posting the logs is really important because not everybody can be involved in all the discussion that occurs all yeah. week. Uh, and so when you have a one hour meeting, that's really, really useful, but you need to have the artifacts of a log or minutes or something um, to let people in the future or that weren't able to attend to see what discussions were and what got made. And I think that's probably gonna be especially important for a development meeting because you're making technical decisions uh, so being able to have some sort of record of that, um, whether that's a log or.